and welcome to the University of Connecticut Center for Land Use Education and Research webinar series. My name is Bruce Hyde and with me today is Alyssa Norwood, uh, Project Manager for Connecticut's Legislative Commission on Aging, who is going to um, speak about uh, planning and zoning in an aging Connecticut. But before we get to that, um, there's a little bit of uh, housekeeping we'd like to do. This is the sixth presentation in the 2015 series. You can see the other ones up there on your screen, and they are available at the UConn website, uh, at the CLEAR website, I should say, clear.ucon.edu. Uh, this uh, webinar will also be uh, uh, recorded and put on our website uh, sometime a couple of days after uh, today. Today we have, uh, as I said, planning and zoning in an aging Connecticut. A little bit about the Center for Land Use Education and Research. Uh, we are a Department of Extension and part of the College of Agriculture, Health, and Natural Resources. Um, we focus mainly on three topical areas, uh, water and water resources, land and climate, and mapping and geospatial. And we have an enormous number of resources uh, for people to go to in any of those areas. If you're interested, again, just visit the website. Now we're going to turn it over to Alyssa Norwood, uh, the project manager for the Connecticut's Legislation Commission on Aging, who will present um, planning and zoning in an aging Connecticut. Well, thank you, Bruce, and thank you for all of you making the time to sign on today and learn more about this important issue. Um, my, as Bruce said, my name is Alyssa Norwood, and I'm project manager with Connecticut's Legislative Commission on Aging. And for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, um, we are a nonpartisan public policy and research office of the Connecticut General Assembly. And our offices are housed right in the state capitol. You can come and visit us up in those eaves up on the fifth floor. Um, we're right under the big gold dome. And we are a small but mighty staff of four. I am the second person over. Um, from the left, flanked on one side by Christy Koval, our communications manager, on the other by Julia Evans Starr, our executive director, and on the far right by Deg McNault, who's our senior policy analyst. And collectively, our charge and our mission is to improve the quality of life for the older adults of both today and tomorrow. And we take that latter half, the tomorrow piece, very seriously and embedded in all of our work, not just livable communities, is very much a lifespan approach. So there's no one constituency we serve because we're all aging and we view our work as very much part of our collective journey in that way. Um, we work to innovate, develop data, and identify and analyze responsible public policy, and that way we really view ourselves and operate as a think tank. And we are among six legislative policy commissions our sister commissions, some reside in the capital, some in offices nearby. And we also like to emphasize that we're part of the legislative branch of government, so not the executive branch. Um, so we, again, operate more in the realm of policy rather than the executive branch, which tends to execute programs more. And uh, we work to bring accountability to state government. And if you're interested in learning more about our broader body of work, you can visit us on our website. The URL is listed at the top, COA for Commission on Aging, .cga.ct.gov. But um, if you come to this page and you click on major initiatives and scroll down, you'll find that our most significant initiative is our Livable Communities Initiative. And it grew out of um, a number of different factors and forces, some of them demographically rooted. So we'll ask the question, is Connecticut getting older? And I'll um, give you the spoiler. The answer is yes. But let me walk you through some visualizations. So um, the Connecticut State Data Center, which is also a part of UConn, um, worked in partnership with us to create this series of maps. And they're based on uh, per population projections that are rooted in 2010 census data. So this is already a map from five years ago, but you get a flavor of where Connecticut is in terms of um, how old we are as a state. So you can see there are five different color bands. And the first color band is tan, and that represents um, portions of the state where less than 13% of the population 
at that moment in time was age 65 and older and going all the way down to the darkest gradations where 20% or more of a particular place was age 65 and older. So if we move ahead to the present, this is where we are today. Um, getting older as a state and we'll march ahead in five year increments based on those projections. So here we are at 2020 and then 2025. Um, so you can see within 10 years, the demographics of the state are going to change very significantly, very radically. Connecticut is not alone. This is a trend happening nationally, internationally, and rooted in the fact that the baby boomers, um, a term you hear often in, in popular culture and media, um, they represent the group of folks who were born between 1946 and 1964. They are headed into older adulthood, um, but this is really a permanent um, and dramatic demographic shift that's happening and we can expect going forward to have to think really differently about how we plan our communities because they're going to serve a significantly older cohort than they have in the past. And just to give you a little bit more Connecticut specific information, Connecticut is the seventh oldest state in the nation based on median age. And um, we can also celebrate the fact that we have the third longest lived constituency. If you're somebody born in Connecticut, you can expect to live to be almost 81 years old if you're born today, which again is the third longest life expectancy in the nation. And just one final slide on some demographic information that's pertinent to um, livable communities today and why the work you do and we do collectively to plan for them is so important. Um, this slide shows gr population growth from 2020 to 2040. And over that 30 year period, if you look at that green line in the middle, overall population growth in Connecticut is expected to be about 11%. That's consistent with national growth. Um, but what's really interesting is when you break it down by age, this vast divergence. Um, so in Connecticut, between age 20 and age 64, that segment of the population is expected to grow by about 2% compared to the age 65 and older population, which is expected to grow by about 57%. So with that comes challenge, but also opportunity, and um, we're excited to share more. And before I delve into the substance of our initiative, I just want to share a bit on a data story that we worked on collectively in partnership with our friends at the Connecticut Data Collaborative. Um, if you go to our homepage after the webinar, there's a um, photograph, an infographic that says interactive data story. And if you click on it, it will bring you to this um, landing page and I'm going to take you there now, now just so you can see the live navigation. Um, you can spend some time with it, but in particular the maps that you saw earlier, there's an interactive page here where you can hover over any town for the years 2010 all the way up in five year increments to 2025 and see how your town fares and what demographic trends look like for your community. So for now, we'll close out of that, and I invite you to spend some time playing with it at your leisure. Um, but we'll move on to the Livable Communities Initiative, which is why you're all on this webinar today. So what is the Livable Communities Initiative? And the Livable Communities Initiative involves a little bit of storytelling. So back in 2012, the Commission on Aging staffed a Aging in Place Task Force um, that was composed of diverse stakeholders and emanating from their recommendations was this notion that we really needed to be more intentional, more planful, more thoughtful across all sectors about what it looks like to plan for an aging Connecticut. And as a result of that recommendation, the following year in 2013, um, a bill was passed. It was House Bill 6396. It became Public Act 13109, and it's now codified in the Connecticut General Statutes and charges Connecticut's Legislative Commission on Aging with leading this Livable Communities Initiative. So what does that mean and what does that look like? 
Um, I'll begin with our values, which we take very seriously. Um, and the one I'd like to highlight first and above all else is this notion of choice. Um, we very strongly in all of the work we do at the commission embrace this notion of choice and hold dearly to the belief that older adults should age with dignity, with independence um, across the entirety of their life. And most of you are very familiar with the narrative of folks who um, are living in a community. They perhaps live there for quite some time. Um, their functional limitations may come to emerge as they age or as other life circumstances occur, and their town might not necessarily be able to accommodate them. So we hold firm to this belief that every Connecticut community should be able to support its residents across the lifespan, and we offer resources to try to empower towns in that journey. Um, we also embrace this notion of accessibility, of being intergenerational, of being cooperative, and making sure that the work that we do is done in a way that serves all populations equitably. You can spend more time with those values on our website. Um, but to delve a little bit deeper into the reason you're all here today, the planning and zoning piece, um, before we go there, I just want to contextualize that in the broader framework of our Livable Communities Initiative. Um, this work is happening internationally um, for the same reasons as demographic trends. The World Health Organization knows that it's not just happening in Connecticut, but there's this international change happening with respect to our population. And as a result, for the past, oh, it's been about six, seven years now, has been spearheading an effort called Age-Friendly Cities related to our livable communities work um, and certainly a uh, research grounding for our work, but different and distinct from it in that, one, um, we embrace this notion that this is not just about cities. This is about all places, rural, suburban, and urban alike. And again, we very much embrace that notion of lifespan approach. So rather than calling it age friendly, we want communities that are livable for all people, regardless of what age and stage of life they're in. Um, but premised on that World Health Organization framework, we've done some of our own research, stakeholder analysis, and had conversations with many of our partners. And as a result, have framed our initiative here in Connecticut around these seven highly interrelated domains. Um, and we're going to be focusing mostly on planning and zoning today, but know when we talk about those planning and zoning initiatives, policies, changes, and projects that you all can be doing in your communities, that they're deeply interrelated with all of these other domains as well. So what could livability look like? We'll march through some slides, and some of you may find in your own communities you see something that looks like this. So the first area that I want to touch on is this notion of complete streets or shared spaces. Um, shared spaces is a term increasingly coming to the forefront. And these photographs are of downtown New Britain. For those of you um, that are listening, that, are, that work for or in any way affiliated with New Britain, we applaud your commitment to livability. For those who have not yet had the opportunity to get downtown, this is an exciting time to be there. Um, they are in the midst of a five-phase project. I believe they're in phase three. So you can see transformation taking place right before your eyes. Um, but the notion of a complete street, for those who aren't familiar with it, is that for a long time, we've built streets that serve cars. And we've done that very well, but sometimes at the exclusion of, or at the very least, at the cost to other users of the street. So the notion of complete streets is that we need to weigh the needs of all users and consider them all in our streetscapes and in our designs. So it's not just cars that use the streets, as you all know, but also bicycles, public transit, depending on the density of your location, and certainly pedestrians. So um, in this rendering, you can see the before versus the projected after. Um, you have room for all different kinds of users of the street. Um, bicycle has enough room to move safely. You have a turn lane to help alleviate congestion when you 
create a more complete street. But above all else, you can see at the bottom left, we have a transportation icon. But this notion of creating a complete street embraces many more domains than just transportation. Um, it's predicated on good planning and zoning and a real vision, a proactive vision for your town to move forward first if you don't yet have one um, with the creation of a, and implementation of a complete streets policy. And um, it's also a place and an opportunity for you to create public spaces. I think we often forget we're so focused on using our streets and our streetscapes as places to promote mobility that we often neglect to make them places to promote community. Um, and in an average town, as much as 90% of its public space is in fact the street. Um, and those of you, um, who hearken back and think back to times when um, sidewalks or e even this morning when a sidewalk provided an opportunity for a meaningful social interaction. And of course, embedded in all of these domains, health promotion, community engagement, public spaces, planning and zoning, transportation, is this notion of economic development. There's hard data that shows that these sort of improvements can be a profound economic driver for a community. Um, to delve a little deeper from a safety perspective, why this is so important, and this isn't new information for many of you, um, but the impact of the design and the speed that that design promotes or inhibits on a street has huge implications for safety. Um, I think the images on the left are particularly telling, so we don't necessarily think about or perceive this as a driver, but the faster you drive, the smaller your field of vision, your functional field of vision is. So you can see what a streetscape might look like from the perspective of a driver moving 15 miles per hour versus 30 miles per hour and the implications for pedestrian safety are obvious. And then the slide on the right shows various stopping distances in terms of how quickly vehicles can stop moving at 20, 30, or 40 miles per hour. This, in fact, has been the main driver of a movement that's been happening across several urban areas. Some of you may have read that there are areas of Washington, D.C. and New York City that have moved toward, um, in some cases, a localized, in other cases, citywide 20 mile per hour speed limit. And what are the implications of that? And um, this particular data is from the United Kingdom, but it's certainly germane to the United States. And you can see the vast differences in the speed at time of impact versus survivability. So at 40 miles per hour, approximately one in three pedestrians that are the result that engaged in adverse traffic event um, don't survive it versus the 1% at 20 miles an hour. But there are obviously some um, individuals that are more vulnerable than others. And if you look at the over 60 year old age group, you can see the impact or the results of an adverse traffic event is much more dramatic. So although attention to these issues helps everyone, they're particularly helpful to older adults in terms of their safety and their perception of safety. They're much more likely to go out and about and retain that functional independence if they're in a place that feels safe. Um, with respect to other ways that you can make your community livable, we often talk about accessory dwelling units, and most of you know this already, but just for the sake of setting forth from definitions, an accessory dwelling unit, it's a room or a set of rooms in a single family zone um, that's been designed or figured to be used as a separate dwelling unit. There's a, usually a permitting process, um, and Connecticut has made great progress in terms of a number of towns across the state allowing for accessory dwelling units in their towns. Um, I had the privilege of being at the National American Planning Association Conference back in Seattle um, in the spring. And in the context of talking about accessory dwelling units, one of the presenters used a term I loved, and it was this idea of insurgent suburbanism. And they explained that to mean the notion that people do things all the time um, that might not conform 
to the letter of zoning code or to the letter of local ordinance in a town. And as a planning community, there are two ways to react to that phenomenon. There's one one mode and that's to come in as the enforcer and to come in and explain why the individual has violated something. Um, but the other frame is to use it as a learning opportunity and to see how many people are in violation of the code and to use it as an opportunity to re-examine and rethink and perhaps even embrace the creativity of residents um, and work in partnership with them to enable them to do what they might already be doing, but in a way that's safe and in a way that addresses the need that's driven them to that behavior. Um, over at the Commission on Aging, we do a lot of studies and we generate a lot of our own data where we see a need to. And um, we have a housing survey in the works. It's almost hot off the presses. We're going to be releasing it at the end of this month. And one of the questions that we asked in it is how important is it to you to have extra space for an aging relative, for an adult child, or for elderly parents, or simply to monetize the extra space? And 84% of Connecticut adults think it's at least somewhat important to have that extra space. So. At an anecdotal level, there is a desire for people to transform aspects of their home to serve others. Um, and this is also happening in the context of the broader social phenomena of definitions of family being fluid and changing. And many of you may have seen in the news um, that there is a continual conversation about what the definition of family is. Anecdotally, we can all perhaps conceive of something a lot broader than family of origin. Um, zoning codes typically do not. And um, the slide at the left, for those of you who haven't heard about it, is in Hartford. There's a street called Scarborough Drive. Um, it's a street lined with beautiful historic mansions. And one group of individuals decided to collectively pool finances and buy that mansion. So. 13 individuals all living in the same house, some related, many not. Um, and it provoked a significant response from the neighbors in the neighborhood and continues to be the subject of a prolonged legal battle, but certainly causes us all to re-examine and think about how we best promote this notion of aging in community and aging in place. And do we perhaps promote if it's right for your community, this notion of how sharing and other creative solutions to help people stay in their communities. Another creative solution that continues to um, pop up across the United States is this notion of co-housing. Some people call them cottage neighborhoods. Some people call them pocket neighborhoods. But overall, they embrace certain key common elements. Um, one is that each of these units are individually owned, but there's a great deal of communal space. And these are all folks who, when buying a co-housing unit, understand, want, and appreciate the notion of community, which happened organically in neighborhoods for a long time, but has been lost for a variety of social reasons and a couple of um, different places, but um, co-housing neighborhoods tend to be highly walkable. All of the parking is on the periphery. Um, it's certainly not a requirement, but a community garden tends to be a very common component. Um, there are other shared spaces. Um, there tends to be some sort of maintenance garage where there's uh, shared lawnmowers and other garden equipment. Um, each unit tends to be equipped with its own kitchen, but there's also a common dining area where people can choose to engage in communal dining. And they really embrace this notion of a lifespan approach um, comfortably or being able to accommodate, many of you have heard the term eight to 80, um, but really all aspects of the lifespan can live quite comfortably in one of these. And right here in Connecticut in uh, Bethany, there is a development that I believe just broke ground called Rocky Corner. It is Connecticut's first official co-housing community, and um, several of the units within the community have been earmarked as affordable housing. The community contains one, two, and three bedroom units. Um, it isn't necessarily the right model or the right fit for every community, but it provides an opportunity for you to 
think about your land uses and to challenge, particularly in a less densely populated locale, how you might be able to use a parcel of land differently to promote aging in community and aging in place. Another aspect of community livability that we talk about and think about a lot um, is this notion of universal design features. And what universal design features are, um, are aspects of a home that allow somebody across the, across the spectrum of functional ability to reside there comfortably. Um, they're not necessarily always immediately apparent or noticeable when you first walk into a home, but they make all the difference in terms of your ability to age in place in it. So what that might include, you could see some of the features here. They might include wider doorways. They might include lower light switches. They might include shelving and other cabinetry that's accessible, um, not just from a standing position, but also either from a wheelchair or with an assistive mo mobility device. And um, retrofitting homes can be expensive, but building them with these features incorporated up front um, is really a tremendous community asset because it allows people to enter a home with one level of functionality and then to continue living there as they might move to another level of functionality. Um, in addition to the fact that the cost is quite minimal, embracing universal design features goes a long way to reducing stigma. Um, if they're part and parcel of every home, people don't think about these things, and um, that's the goal. And we're pleased to say that um, at the state level, there's a process to apply for what's called a CHAMP grant. CHAMP stands for Competitive Housing Assistance for Multifamily Properties. And in most recently, this new round of application, the, um, the for the very first time, at least one unit, there's a requirement that somebody developing one of these properties, at least one unit has to be universally accessible. So a step in the right direction. And from a planning and zoning perspective in Connecticut, we recognize that there's a lot of existing housing stock, but to the extent that there's new construction, if there's any way to condition approval um, on the inclusion of universal design features or otherwise promote universal design features, we embrace that as an aging in place strategy. Um, so we talked a lot about transportation and house and home. And now I wanna to move to public and outdoor spaces, the places where we spend our time outside of our home and interact with each other and form real community. And this is Stratton Brook State Park. It's out in Simsbury. It's a beautiful spot for those of you who have been there. And in 1996, it became the first state park in Connecticut to have a total retrofit of all of its facilities. And that includes its parking, its trails, its restrooms, its picnic areas, even the beach. And the totality of the facilities are accessible now to older adults and persons with disabilities. So you can see there's um, a feature right adjacent adjacent to the sand, there are boards so that somebody who might otherwise have difficulty navigating the terrain of a beach can have ready access to the water. There's a trail loop that circumvents the totality of that pond, graded appropriately for anyone in a wheelchair or using an assistive mobility device, and really embraces this notion um, of inclusion and celebrates people working, living, and playing together. With respect to additional outdoor features, um, you can see Elizabeth Park is on the left. It's a West Hartford property. And then going a little farther from home um, is a park in Portland, Oregon. And our outdoor spaces are such a completely important place for people of all ages, especially in the nice weather. And um, there's a lot of opportunity for creativity in the redesign of outdoor spaces, but sometimes losing or subsuming what's important to older adults in the process. So this is really basic, and I point it out because we've lost this in some of our parks, but as new bench designs um, that integrate public art features and um, all sorts of beauty get introduced across Connecticut and across the United States, um, we've lost, in some cases, two critical components, and those are backs on our benches and also armrests. 
So just pointing out sometimes small details are critically important to creating a place that we can all age successfully. And then one feature of the memory garden down at the right in Portland, Oregon. So just by way of a bit of background, um, the memory garden in Portland, Oregon, I believe was the first space in the United States that was designed specifically for um, individuals and their families um, that were experiencing dementia. And the memory garden has several features, but the one I want to point out today is if you take a look at those flower beds, they're pitched at an angle so that the foliage and flowers can be enjoyed on the tall side by somebody in the standing position and on the short side by somebody in the sitting position, perhaps in a wheelchair or otherwise unable to stand up and enjoy the foliage. So just being very attentive. And if, if you walk away from this webinar with anything, understanding that what we really want you to do in every plan, policy, project, or decision you make is to embed this notion of a lifespan approach and be thoughtful about those details and how they can serve everyone of all ages and of all abilities. Um, and before we leave the topic of public and outdoor spaces, again, sometimes it's the small investments and the small wins that can have really significant impact. Um, if you look at the far left, there was um, a recent grant that was awarded to Salisbury, and the grant was used um, to uh, introduce a wayfinding campaign. So those signs um, are critically important to livability in your town and to be thoughtful about font size, um, you know, what level of functionality in terms of vision would you need in order to see the sign? How readable are they? Think about the person in your town who might have the most significant struggle and make sure that the signs serve them in addition to somebody um, with a different visual ability. And then on the right, to always think creatively about opportunities to use your public and outdoor spaces to create community. Um, the idea of an outdoor reading room, irrespective of our New England winters, um, has become increasingly popular. And um, there are free mobile libraries that even individuals can apply for and uh, a cabinet shipped to your home, put on your front lawn. And the idea is to create community in that way and to invite people to sit, spend time outside, enjoy a book, and perhaps enjoy some social interaction as well, making your town and space more livable. And then finally, for those of you who were in, who were in Hartford last week, um, there is um, an international movement called Parking Day. Hartford, I believe um, this was its third annual Parking Day, and a pun on the word park, this notion that parking spots, places that we normally reserve for cars, need to be reclaimed by the park or the green space that we so often celebrate. Um, and it's just a fun all around event, but it certainly captures the notion that um, this sort of creativity, the notion of public art, the notion of building community and this idea of um, creating scheduled events um, that really bring out town and community together is so, so important to community livability. So again, to reiterate what I said previously, that our notion is really about the importance of embedding a lifespan approach in all that you do. And some of you may be aware of this, but for those who aren't, um, again, back in um, 2014, um, yes, that's right, 2014, the Connecticut General Assembly, subsequent to the creation of the Livable Communities Initiative, um, wanted to underscore and make sure that at the local level, towns were really trying to take heart and implement this notion of community livability. So in um, the section of the Connecticut General Statutes um, that codifies what ought to be in a local plan of conservation and development, I draw your attention down to the all too small font um, that's part I of the statute, but basically it says that plans of conservation and development should give consideration to um, what can allow somebody to age in place and age in community. 
So what about the data? We've talked a lot about what people want. So how do we know this is what people want? So anecdotally, you can walk around, you can talk to folks, and there's a real social movement where if you ask people where and how do you want to age, overwhelmingly, they'll tell you that they want to age in their homes, and if, pos if that's not possible, at the very least, to age in their community. But what about beyond that, and how does it support some of the other um, information that we've showed you today? So back in March, we conducted a uh, poll, and it was based on a national poll that the American Planning Association did. We replicated their methodology, and we asked folks a series of questions in Connecticut about their preferences around aging in place and also what they want out of their communities. And the findings were interesting and compelling, and we're releasing them as a series of three reports. Uh, the first one came out in May, and as I mentioned, we're on the cusp of releasing our second one on housing. But to go back to the one on transportation for a moment, um, I just wanted to highlight a few key facts. So one, which you all know better than anyone, is that people are looking for and seeking more choice with respect to transportation. So you can see the top left orange square um, shares that right now 92% of Connecticut residents who are age 50 and older rely on their cars as their primary transit mode. And that's higher than in any other age group. So it's our oldest adults in Connecticut, our older age cohort that's really primarily relying on cars right now. But interestingly, if you look at the other orange box on the right hand side across all ages, 10% fewer residents plan to use their cars as future primary transit. So cars are the only modality where you're looking at a drop going forward. Biking, busing, walking, those are all areas where we're going to see increases in activity in the next several years. And true to that, in the green box, if you ask um, older adults, we asked all age groups, but if you ask older adults in particular, um, how often do you bike it? how often do you bike now and how often do you intend to bike in the future, the largest increases you see in the older adult groups. And finally, in addition to increased bus usage, um, another really compelling result is around place and placemaking and also related to walkability. And that's that blue box on the bottom left. So if you ask, pe ask people, what, what sort of place do you live in now? 40% of people who live in Connecticut will characterize it as a suburb where most people usually drive. And then if you ask people, well, what sort of place do you want to live in in the future? That same category, only 8% still want to live here. So again, you all know this better than anyone, but we're on the cusp um, of a lot of really interesting change. You all are very familiar with the term smart growth, um, and this only adds to the import of embracing placemaking that promotes transportation choices beyond the car. With respect to additional data, um, at the national level, AARP has been a real thought leader in this work of livability. And just this last spring, they released an online tool called the Livability Index. You can Google it, but if you're quick with your pen or want to check your slides later, the URL is at the bottom. And the Livability Index is a tool that pools data from over 60 different sources across a variety of indicators. For example, in the realm of housing, one measurement might be the percent of folks in your town um, who spend more than 30% of their income on housing, and a variety of other factors. And this index generates a score for your community. So we'll take a closer look. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Clear out in Haddam, Connecticut. So I pulled Haddam's score before coming out here. You can see not unlike our Connecticut for Livable Communities initiative, AARP also has their data organized into different domains or categories, a little different than ours. And in this tool, 100 is a perfect score. No community has 100. Um, and 50 is average. So in the realm of livability, Haddam is doing a little better than average. But if you dig a little deeper, you can see areas where, at least based on the indicators, Haddam has some challenges and some opportunities. Um, and above all else, because this 
particular tool is based on objective data sources, more than anything else, it's meant to be the beginning of a community conversation and to dig deeper to try to figure out where in this vast realm of making places more livable, folks want to focus limited time and perhaps limited resources. So moving from information to action, the question then becomes, what do I do? Um, and we've tried very hard in our initiative to give you tools to inspire you toward action and also to leverage the tremendous um, knowledge and expertise and successes across the state um, that have been going on and predated by far the, the work of our own initiative. So to start, I redirect you back to our website, which again is coa.cga.ct.gov. And if you go up to the top tab that says major initiatives and you scroll down, you'll be able to click on livable communities, which will take you to um, our livable communities website. Some people call it a website within a website because it really is and it does have its own standalone URL, livablect.org. If you click on any of the domains, it'll bring you to information and resources with respect to each of those domains. We're a work in progress, we're constantly growing and we look to all of you boots on the ground to help us grow our resource catalog. So if any of you find something missing or have a resource that you think lends itself well, to this conversation around community livability, by all means, send it our way. And in terms of next steps to take, the place to start, we think, is a community conversation. And some towns are real thought leaders and town leadership is well aware of the demographic trends that we shared with you. Others not, but irrespective of where you are, it's a useful check to um, head to our interactive data story to see what proportion of your town's older adults are age 65 and older, where you're heading, and then to conduct an assessment. And this image that you see here is the front page of a brochure that we've created. It's on our website under publications. And if you open up the brochure and move into the inside, um, we've created a checklist. And that checklist contains seven different domains. Um, broadly, we nest them under physical environment and also social environment. And when we say checklist, it's not to imply that every town should do every one of these things. But this is a broad menu of opportunity of areas for you to consider and to see where your strengths are, where some opportunities are for growth, and to think about what your priorities in terms of shaping community livability. So again, this tool, if you go to our Livable Communities landing page and click on Getting Started and then click on Assessment, you'll be able to find this brochure or feel free to contact me after the webinar and we can send hard copies out. With respect to funding, um, funding can present challenges and there is no livable communities funding stream per se. But the good news is, is there's lots of opportunity with respect to existing funding streams um, to create and promote and shape community livability. And a lot of it is just about thinking differently and doing differently with what you have. And by way of example, Complete streets is one area where folks know you might be at the forefront of it. We're paving and repaving all the time. Our winters are brutal to our streets. And every time there's a repaving project, that's an opportunity for restriping, for rethinking, and not necessarily making any changes to physical infrastructure, to changing the width from one curb to the next, but to reallocating the space you have differently. Maybe parking needs to be oriented differently. Maybe landscaping suddenly serves as a buffer to promote pedestrian safety so that cars whizzing by don't per, per, uh, cars whizzing by don't make uh, pedestrians feel quite as uncomfortable. So restriping is one area where with the same funding and no additional resources, you have an opportunity in your town to be a real change agent. And then finally on our website, we have a map called Innovations and Ideas. We are just beginning to build it out and we challenge you to put your town on the map. Um, the goal is to have this map covered and to be able to click on any given town 
Um, we have a great deal of resources up there already, but if you have an innovation, an idea, or something that you'd like to share with your sister towns in Connecticut, we very much want to inspire change without reinventing the wheel. So by way of example, we have a couple of complete streets policies that are up on our website, and we hope as towns move forward with considering complete streets um, that you'll look to other towns to see how you might use them as a starting block or foundation for your own work. And again, uh, our conception of community livability is broad, so this encompasses things far beyond planning and zoning, but due to the deeply interconnected nature of this work, um, it's all inclusive and cross-cutting, and we're very proud of that. And finally, the one thing that I'd like to leave you with um, is this image, which is one of a series of photographs created um, by the very talented photographer Tom Hussey. And um, what's interesting about it, he's not just a photographer, but a master computer manipulator. The image in the mirror of this older woman is indeed a photograph of her younger self, um, which been, has been manipulated into that mirror. But I really think it encapsulates the notion that we've been trying to convey today, that this is very much um, a collective journey and one of shared fate. And don't we all have that moment where we look in the mirror and we might be surprised by what we see. And in the end, the people that you serve are people. Um, and we like to say at the Commission on Aging that age is just a number and that the essence of who we are remains unchanged over the lifespan. So to honor that, to support it, to promote it, and to plan your communities in such a way that you can support people across their lives journeys, your own, those of your family, and those you hold dear. So with that, I thank you and I open the floor up for questions. Well, we don't seem to be getting any questions, um, but I just want to say one thing that uh, certainly seeing that map of Connecticut uh, turn black over the course of 15 years caught my attention, and it's something that uh, all communities are going to have to be dealing with over the next couple of years, and as we are all planners, we need to take that role very um, seriously and plan for how we keep um, our elderly in in the state of uh, Connecticut and in our towns. Um, it's as important to do this for the folks that are elderly as it is to do those for, as those who have just left town and have gone off to college or gone somewhere and want to come back and live. And affordable housing is one of the keys to that. So uh, here we do have a question. What are the most creative ideas that you have seen added to Connecticut plans of conservation and development or from anywhere? Thank you for that question. Um, we're very much on the beginning of our journey and trying to answer that question ourselves, um, but aspects of plans of conservation and development that we seem to be important, uh, that we see to be important as a starting point, one certainly to um, make an allowance for or promote or have an understanding that unrelated individuals need to be supported in their endeavor to live together, that people want to age in place. And for many folks, um, being successful in that endeavor requires robust home-based community supports and services. Um, at the state Medicaid level, which is the largest single provider of long-term supports and services, and that comprises 14% of the state budget for those who weren't aware of that, um, there is a national movement um, to incentivize and inspire folks who are interested to transition out of institutional settings and back into their communities. So the state's Department of Social Services under Money Follows the Person is moving folks back and housing challenges continue to rise to the top as a, a significant impediment to, to the extent that POCDs can rethink um, and, and support people that need to be cared for in their homes, that's significant. Um, we also see complete streets to be a really important aspect um, to a good POCD and promoting that, and also just more broadly beyond ADUs, thinking about rethinking the definition of family. Okay, the next question. Actually, they're coming in like wildfire now. Do you find it easier to promote some of these practices if you make the case that they can address the needs of kids as well as seniors? 
that's a great question. And I thank you for asking it. Um, there's a lot of synergy and opportunity and untapped potential and a whole realm of, um, of data that I didn't talk about. But the short answer is yes, which is why we so strongly support a lifespan approach. Um, you know, for anyone walking around the neighborhood, a curb cut most definitely serves a mom pushing a stroller as readily as it does somebody using an assistive mobility device in the realm of shared spaces down in Norwalk. Um, intergenerationality is so important and so symbiotic. There is um, a, a facility where there is a daycare on day on floor one of the facility, and then on the floors above it is a senior housing complex, and there's robust opportunity for interaction and volunteering. So, you know, the short answer is yes, um, New York has some really innovative um, sharing of spaces and of vehicles. School buses are used during the day um, when they're not otherwise in use to transport older adults. And um, schools themselves are ripe with opportunity to be shared spaces. In some places, schools and uh, community centers are co-located for some of their programming. So lo lots of exciting synergy there. Next question is, can you point to towns in Connecticut that have the best zoning codes for accessory dwellings? Another great question. Um, and uh, we are in the midst right now, we're, we're somewhat building the plane as we fly it, but we are in the midst of um, developing relationships around the state with our councils of government and the Capital Region Council of Government with whom we sit. Um, has done some really great work through their sustainable land use corridor project. And I believe uh, linked on our website, but also on their website, they have model regulations around accessory dwelling units, um, as well as other model codes that help support livability. Okay, the next question, and I, I'm curious if you have an answer for this one, because I certainly have no clue what, what they're talking about here. Do you see the prevalence of Airbnb and other sharing opportunities as a way to keep seniors in their homes affordably to supplement income and sometimes improve social opportunities for seniors? And do you see communities in Connecticut working to prevent Airbnb, et cetera, because of the impact on inns, hotels, et cetera? So this one is a hot topic. I don't know of a single town that isn't addressing or another way having conversation around Airbnb. Um, you know, there's nothing easy about being a planner or being a planning and zoning official because it's a game of balance. So I think the arguments are obvious and have been well articulated with respect to the impact, sometimes adverse impact on inns, hotels and so forth because of Airbnb. Um, but for those of you who can access it, perhaps I can send this around after the webinar, Airbnb recently commissioned a study. Um, so you can take it for what it's worth. It's a study they commissioned and they had a third party do it, sort of assessing what the positive impact was of Airbnb on the lives of, of older adults. And as you imply in your question, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, people are driven to put their homes on Airbnb for different reasons. Supplemental income is certainly one, but also the vast opportunity for social connectivity. There are older adults who say Airbnb and the opportunity to host a diverse group of people has been their lifeline. It's been their sense of purpose, and it's really helped to combat this notion of social isolation that's prevalent throughout our society, but certainly uh, per, uh, there are particular challenges with respect to the older adult population in that way. So. I think that's often an underplayed conversation that Airbnb has recognized and is trying to make sure that the, the world understands that they promote some social good in that way. Well, I think that appears to be it for the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Alyssa, for a fascinating talk on planning and zoning in an age in Connecticut. I encourage all of you to get in touch with Alyssa if you have any questions or like some guidance on how to address this issue in the future. Thank you.